Uh, so I will stop my video right now. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I'm going to turn on, hang on, one more thing here. All right, so we're good to go. So the name of the presentation is The Path from GIS Manager to GIS Leader. And, you know, we really need to, um, you know, there's a big difference between managers and leaders, and we've got lots of managers, but we need more leaders. And so my job is to get out there and inspire people to make that leap from manager to leader. Um, and so I'll talk to you about, you know, some ways that you can do that and then give you some examples of other people that have done that. But before I can get started, uh, we need to interrupt this message uh, because of what's going on these days. And of course, that's coronavirus. So I did want to acknowledge coronavirus and the pandemic and what's happening in regards to us as GIS professionals before I do the, the regular presentation. You know, this global pandemic is one of the major challenges that humanity has ever had to face. You know, there's some benefits though to the GIS community that come out of this. You know, everything about this pandemic is spatial and we've been thrust into the spotlight. You know, everybody affected by this tragedy is looking for answers and we're at the center of those um, and we can provide those answers. So now is our time to shine. You know, this is an incredible opportunity to be noticed and advance people's knowledge and appreciation for what we do. So I wanna show some examples of how the GIS community has responded to this amazing crisis. You know, first, you know, I'm sure you recognize this dashboard. This is perhaps the most visible map in the world right now. It's the COVID-19 global map and dashboard from Johns Hopkins University. And it was created by a PhD student, a gentleman named En Sheng Dong in about eight hours. And once it was publicly released in January, it went viral. Yeah, that's a pun that it was intended. It went viral quickly and it now gets over a billion hits per day. I mean, that's just crazy. That's almost 14,000 hits per second. And it's designed to handle over 2 billion hits per day. And at this point, over 1 trillion people have already seen it. Really just an amazing piece of, of work that's just um, exploded and shown everybody what the power of GIS can do uh, you know, to help the world. And they also released the United States dashboard that provides detailed information at the county level. And it's really interesting to see all the people that are using this. I mean, here's an example of an executive user of the dashboard. You know, this tweet is from the acting De deputy secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Ken Cuccinelli. And at one point, the dashboard was down and he couldn't do what he needed to do because it was down. So that, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, just to see the impact of this, you know, really, uh, just recently, Time released their 100 Most Influential People of 2020, and Lauren Gardner, uh, who runs the um, the center at Johns Hopkins, where where En Cheng Dong works, um, she was labeled one of the most influential people in the world, and she was labeled in the pioneer category. So really amazing what John Johns Hopkins has do has done to forward GIS uh, and our uh, visibility across the globe. There's lots of other examples. Uh, here's a dashboard from the World Health Organization. Uh, here's one from the US Census Bureau. Uh, here's, a, here's one from ESRI. Uh, this one is fairly new. It's come out in the last, I think it came out in August, the end of August. It's called the COVID Pulse app. And it uses data updated daily to show the trends of the COVID pandemic across the US by state and by county. And it's using the same data that the Johns Hopkins dashboard is using. And once you zoom in, you can access this county level data for new cases per capita, the deaths per capita and cumulative cases, as well as the current phase of the pandemic. So pandemics cycle through six phases, emergent, spreading, epidemic, controlled, end state and no cases. And this map provides that current phase for each county in the US. Uh, and it's really an effective visualization tool for the historic trend as well as the current situation. And the response of the GIS community to deploy apps supporting efforts to fight this pandemic has really been amazing. Esri's cataloged 382 apps in the US and 336 apps across the globe. That's over 700 total. And the thing these apps have in common is that they're configurable. So there's no time for custom coding when you have something hit when time is of the essence like the pandemic. So they're configurable, they're not custom coded. They're just configurable apps that you can quickly pour data into, you know, configure it and off you go. The next thing is they're user centric. They're accessible to anyone. Uh, they work on any device, anywhere at any time and they're pretty easy to, e easy to use. 
and they're data driven. They're designed to showcase the data with visualization and analytics. And as I said, they're simple and easy to use. So congratulations to those hard workers behind the scenes, you know, you know putting together these important GIS apps. And I may want to make sure that our work on this issue isn't over. In fact, it's just starting. You know, there's still a lot of opportunities for us to contribute. You know, here's a list of COVID-19 solutions that are open source, free and configurable that may be deployed to support the continuing fight and recovery from the epidemic, from the pandemic. And you can find these online at that URL at the bottom. So we've got apps for business continuity, site safety, health screening, response, testing sites, recovery metrics, vulnerable populations, small business recovery, force readiness, hospitalization and PPEs, business report, re reopening. And there's a new one that they're, they're coming out with to help figure out how to distribute the vaccine. So our work has just started. You know, Don't think if you've put up a dashboard or a hub site that you're done. There's still lots of work to be done um, for us in this pandemic space. Um, and again, also we have a, a COVID modeling toolbox. So the official models that some of these epidemiologists use, such as the CHIME model or the surge model, they've been ported into ArcGIS Pro. You can actually run the modeling there within them. So if you work with the people that need help in any of these areas, please reach out to them and offer your assistance. I just wanna talk about some of the COVID-19 effects from this. So people at the top now are dealing with hard times and they're dealing with reduced budgets. They're dealing with having to save money. They're dealing with having to digitally transform their organization. And they're having to deal with pay, no more paper because when people are working remotely, you really can't use paper and manual-based workflows anymore. So the people that lead organizations across the globe are looking for help. They're looking to their staff to say, we need help with our reduced budget. We need help saving money. We need help digitally transforming and getting rid of our paper manual paper based workflows. So what does that mean? GIS can help in all those areas. So when an executive turns to their IT director or their CIO or whoever and says, what do you have? How can you help me with these things? We want to make sure that GIS is at the top of that list because we can help with all of these things. We want to make sure that we're being used uh, effectively across the organization. So with that spotlight on us, now's our time to step into it and shine and do as much as we can to help the whole community and our organizations through um, through this, this incredible um, time that we're living through. And that's what leaders do. When times are tough, they step up and they help out and they make that organization you know, survive this bad time and emerge even better before. So great opportunity for us to, to do that. All right, so now let's get started with the, the, the real presentation here. And I'm gonna start off with why we need GIS leaders. Uh, I ran across this article back in 2011, so nine years ago, and it really motivated me to do more. And it said that generally people outside of GIS think of GIS just as maps or graphic product or the younger brother of CAD. And it really made me angry because I, you know, I know it's more valuable than that as you do. But this attitude, even nine years later, is common across the U.S. and just about every organization I get to, actually across the globe. And then there was this article, you know, five years ago that said that GIS is often seen as maps or visual graphics product, and the more advanced capabilities are ignored because they remain unknown to key departments and decision makers. And then this one just two years ago. Uh, talking about a survey of, of executives and asking them what were the biggest hurdles to, you know, getting the most benefit of their GIS investment. And they said that there was a lack of awareness among users and policymakers as the biggest challenge with over 38% listing it as the primary hurdle and 38% that was the largest answer. That same article had this quote in it that said the geospatial industry is still undervalued and underappreciated by the world at large. The onus is on us to collectively demonstrate how location data and tools can be applied to make dramatic improvements to society, from making every journey safer and our air cleaner to helping businesses operate more efficiently. That's a really great quote because it's our job to fix this. And like I said, having the spotlight of the pandemic on us and great tools like the Johns Hopkins dashboards and all those 700 other apps that are out there is a great step forward, but there's still a lot of work to do. So now that we know we need more leaders, let's see how we can lead by helping our organizations win with location intelligence. And I'm gonna talk about location intelligence in a specific way. And it's important for us to understand this need to talk in different terms. Um, we need to talk instead of technology, we need to talk about capabilities. So a capability is the power or ability to do something. 
Now, people outside of the GIS world, they don't understand our technology, and we are comfortable with our technology, and we like to talk technology. So quite often, to non-GIS professionals, we'll start talking technology, and usually it ends up confusing them or boring them or you lose their attention or what have you. So we need to switch the conversation. When you're talking to people that are not GIS professionals or users, we need to quit talking technology and start, start to talk capability. And the capability, and because capabilities are interesting to people at the top of an organization. They always want to expand capabilities. They wanna add new capabilities to their workforce and their organization. So if you start talking about capabilities, um, you'll get their attention. And the capability that GIS can enable in an organization is location intelligence. Um, and then normally I, I show a video here about what is location intelligence, but it's hard to do that remotely and, and over the web. So I'll just ask you to, you know, Google Esri and what is location intelligence. It's a short two minute video that we put together with Fast Company Magazine. And it's meant to be seen by executives. And it explains what is location intelligence and what the value is. And it gives a lot of statistics actually that there's lots of executives out there that know what location intelligence is and they're win willing to spend money on it. So let's switch this conversation from GIS to location intelligence. And when we do that, you know, putting making or enabling a new uh, capability like location intelligence in an organization is very different than just implementing technology. Uh, and so there's additional things you need to be aware of if you're going to be successful with location intelligence in your organization. And I really suggest that everybody go to this URL and download this document. Uh, this is one of the best documents I've seen in my 25 plus year career uh, in GIS, and it's put together by Esri Canada and IDC. And they surveyed 200 organizations across Canada in all industries. And these organizations had 500 or more employees, and they analyzed how these organizations were using location intelligence. And the ones that were the most successful, they figured out why they were successful and they identified common best practices among all these organizations. And so when you look at this document, you can, they've sliced and diced it so you can see exactly what industry you're in and what best practices fall out there and follow them. And it's really, really good guidance for being successful with location intelligence in an organization. But one of the great things about this, or another great thing about this document is they divided up all these best practices into what they call the five pillars of location intelligence. And this um, is just a really great way, a framework to look at what we need to be doing. And these are just five things that we should be doing in our organization and focusing on and have strategies for to be successful with, with location intelligence. And they are strategy, organization, technology and data, culture and literacy. So if you're gonna be successful with GIS and location intelligence in your organization, you've gotta work on all five of these. You can't only focus on the middle one, technology and data. And I know most of the GIS professionals spend 100% of their time working in technology and data. Just having good technology and data does not make location intelligence successful. So the, if there's one thing you take away from this speech today, it's that we need to spend our time across all five of these pillars every day to be successful and make the organization work better. So I want you to look at these numbers. These are important numbers. And as I move through this presentation, I'm gonna reveal their meaning. And I want you to think about it each time. And so these numbers are 64, 76, 78, 84, and 84. So let's look at each of the five pillars, take them off one by one and just do, do a little bit deeper dive into each one. And let's start with strategy. Now, if you're gonna be successful with GIS in your organization, you must have a strategy. And the importance of a strategy cannot be understated. In fact, in a September 2019 survey from McKinsey and Company, that was about how leaders in data and analytics have pulled ahead, they found that the creation of a strategy now ranks as the number one challenge to and reason for a company's success at data and analytics. All right, so GIS is data and analytics. And this means that if you're gonna be successful with it, the number one reason you're successful is because of your strategy. And if you're not successful, the number one challenge that's making you not successful is a strategy. So I know it's, it's hard to set time uh, aside to do one, but you've got to do a strategy. And if you're going to do a strategy, you're probably going to have to get a, um, spend some time on it. You're probably going to have approval from your supervisor to spend time and effort on this strategy. And so you're going to need to explain to them why you need a strategy. 
Well, a you know, wonderful person in our GIS community, Matt Lewin out of uh, Esri Canada, who was actually part of that uh, location intelligence report, wrote this great article on LinkedIn all about why organizations need a geospatial strategy and executive perspective. And he gives you five reasons that you can apply to your executive and let them know why you need one. Needed to unlock new sources of value, to strengthen a digital strategy, to enrich the customer experience, to establish a shared data foundation, and because the IT strategy missed it. So I'll provide the slides here that, that they can distribute out to you guys. And these are all hyperlinked right to those articles. So you can go read these articles. But the reason we need strategic plans is that my research shows that 64%, this is that first of those five big numbers of organizations that use GIS don't have and maintain a GIS strategic plan. So you simply cannot be successful without a strategic plan. So it's, it's just imperative that everybody work on that if you don't have one. So what is a geospatial strategy? Well, geospatial strategy is a business oriented plan that defines how an organization will use GIS to achieve its goals a business oriented, not technology oriented. So we're gonna focus on the business and what can we do to make the business better? So an effective geospatial strategy connects the business needs with the right people, processes and technology to help you overcome challenges and improve results. So if you're gonna provide value to the organization, you're gonna help the organization overcome challenges and improve their results and get the business done. And it's not just technology, it's working with people and processes or workflows as well. So let me show you an easy way to understand this. Number one, you start off with what are the goals of your organization? So every organization usually has a strategic plan or they've got a list of major initiatives, or maybe if they've got a performance management systems, they've got a list of KPIs or key performance indicators. Whatever those are in your organization, you need to find out what the goals and mission uh, and the major initiatives that your organization is trying to accomplish. And you're gonna have to talk to the people at the top that are in charge of meeting those goals. And you're gonna talk to them and you're gonna find out about the goals, but then you're also gonna find out what challenges they're hitting that are keeping them from achieving those goals. And once you know those, you can then come back and you can actually propose GIS solutions that help them overcome the challenges and reach their goals. And if you do that, ta-da, you've got business value of GIS, and that's what we're looking for. So what's the one word that's in all four circles? Business. This is all about business, not technology. Are there, our job is simply to help the organization achieve its goals and get its business done. If you do that, it's amazing what can happen. And let me show you a great, great story. This is from Bonneville County, Idaho. So this is in the southeast part of Idaho. And I'm going to show you what can happen if you show if you uh, really show business value. Um, so this is uh, the county seats Idaho Falls. The population is about 115,000 people, and they started with a single GIS professional in 2015. Now, because they're susceptible to wildfires, they deployed some configurable commercial off-the-shelf ArcGIS solutions to support wildfire response, and this completely replaced paper-based workflows they had always used in the past. And then, unfortunately they sure enough got hit with some wildfires. But as a result of this, the county provided a better emergency response experience to their end users than they ever had in the past. Now this, along with some other great, you know, high business value work they did, convinced management to let the county add five more full-time GIS professionals. So they went from one to six. So we all know how hard it is to get new, brand new full-time employees approved. Here's a county of 115,000 that through some work that really revolutionized the way the county worked and added business value, they got five more positions approved. So it's really amazing what can happen um, if you actually uh, you know, deliver business value. So over decades of working with our organizations in all industries across the globe to make them successful with our technology, we at Esri have identified a best practice for developing and executing a geospatial strategy. And it consists of four steps, understand, plan, act, and revisit. So first you understand the business of the organization, those goals and challenges. Next, you plan out your response to those challenges by identifying the people, process, technology, and data required to implement the solution. Then you act by implementing the solution. And then lastly, you revisit the understand phase again as the goals and challenges are constantly changing. So this is an ongoing process, not a one-time thing. So it's a way of doing business. It's not a big document that sits on the shelf. 
If you want to learn more about this, check out this URL. Uh, you can download this PDF. It's not too long and it will introduce this concept of this four-step method and how you can move forward with it. And reach out to your Esri account team and they can give you um, help you get started with it as well. All right, so let's look at the second pillar, which is organization. And we're gonna look at our second big number. 76% of organizations that use GIS do not have formal governance in place. So organization is a big category. I'm gonna pull out one part of it, which is governance. And I'm not talking about data governance. I'm talking about organizational governance. How does uh, GIS formally function? And is it, how is it set up to work in an organization? Um, formal governance around GIS is not easy to do, but if you do it, it will make you so much more successful. It's another big piece of being successful with GIS and location intelligence. And so I'd like to sh um, send you to some resources. Uh, this is uh, Matt Lewin again from Esri Canada, and he's done a lot of writing on this. He's one of the you know, brightest people in, in our community. I suggest you, you follow him and read all the stuff that he puts out, but he's got a great set of blogs on um, from Esri Canada that, uh, that go over governance, there's a video, et cetera. So if you need some guidance on governance, reach out to um, these resources um, that Matt has put together. And again, also reach out to your Esri account team uh, to see what you can do there. All right, the third pillar is uh, technology and data. Um, well, of course, we all know um, we're all, this is our home, this is where we're comfortable. But what I would like to call out here on technology and data are best practices. Um, best practices are called best practices for a reason. They're the recommendations um, that help you avoid the pitfalls that others, others have fallen into. And too many times I've talked to GIS uh, users and they're completely unaware of what the best practices are and they have not implemented any of them. And I promise you, if you implement the best practices that apply to you and your organization, your GIS will be more performant, you'll be more successful, uh, you'll have fewer technical support calls, it will just run much better. So um, here's another number that's uh, showing the problem we have here, and that's that 78% of the GIS practitioners have not read the Bible, according to Esri, of our ArcGIS best practices. So this is that document. Uh, you can go to that URL to get this document. It's going to cover people, data, process, and technology. Uh, be aware that this document is a living document because it changes along with the technology landscape. And as we find new best practices, they get added, and as old ones uh, get deleted. So it was just updated in September, um, and, but it's updated at least three times per year. So if you haven't read this document, download it. It's not overly technical and it's not too long, um, but it's a really great guide to help you set your GIS up to get the most out of it. So again, work with uh, our partners and our in your Esri account team to, to work through those and figure out which ones implement, um, apply to your organization and which ones you should implement. All right, the next of the five pillars is culture. So um, again, this is a wide category. What I wanna focus on here is uh, change management. Um, and when I'm talking about change management, I'm not talking about software change management. I'm talking about architecture um, or organizational change management. And that is helping people uh, accept change in the technology in their environment. And um, if you if you implement change management in your organization, you'll get less resistance to change. You'll get better technology adoption. Um, and so it's a it's a big it's a big another way to be really successful with GIS. And here's the problem we've got, because again, 84% of organizations that use GIS do not have and maintain a change management plan. And so the biggest challenge of a successful GIS implementation is the people problem. You can set up all the technology you want. If people aren't using it, it's, it's not effective. So the solution to this is implementing a change management program. And here is the definition from one of the industry leaders. It's the discipline that guides how we prepare, equip, and support people to successfully adopt change in order to drive organizational success and outcomes. And research shows that those organizations that have a change management program, their technology adoption is six times more successful than those that don't. So if you've got change management program in your organization, reach out to them and get involved with it. If not, you know, seek to get some assistance with it. I will let you know that Esri does have a change management consulting practice. So you can reach out to your Esri account team to get more information about that if you're interested. And Michael Green is on that team. He's a great um, 
resource. And he and his team have published quite a lot of writing about this and videos, et cetera. So again, when I get, get you guys these slides, you'll, get, um, you'll be able to hyperlink to this, to that as well. All right, so the last of the five pillars is literacy. Uh, and again, literacy is a large, you know, broad term. So what I'd like to focus on is training or workforce development. And um, it's critical that everybody in your organization that uses GIS get at least some training every year because this stuff is changing so, so fast. And you guys are investing a lot of time and resources into GIS. You want to get the most out of it and you won't unless you get people trained up um, on the best ways on how to use it. And again, we've got issues here because the last of my five numbers shows that 84% of organizations that use GIS do not have and maintain a workforce development plan. So a workforce development plan is a plan that looks at your organization and looks at the people that use GIS and their roles and responsibilities, and then recommends uh, training in a certain order for each one of them, depending on what they do. So Esri offers a ton of courses. It's really hard to go in there and figure out who needs what. So what you can do is if you work with your Esri account team, you can get in touch with a training consultant and they'll work with you to create one of these plans at no cost to you. And then the other good thing about this plan is it helps you get funding for training because I know funding for training usually gets cut a lot of times and it's hard to get. But with a plan that shows this is recommended from the vendor for the people that have access to the software in order to be successful with it, you're much more likely to get it with a, with a, uh, a development plan. So definitely please do that. We also do have some generic learning plans that are available to you online. Um, and these are instances such as if you want to get all of your desktop movers or users off of ArcMap and onto ArcGIS Pro, you can come up here and you can get a generic learning plan on how to get people from Map onto Pro. So definitely check those uh, learning plans uh, that are available to you online. Okay, so next what I'd like to do is show you, show you some examples of people in our community, your peers, that have moved up from GIS managers into leaders and are really changing this landscape um, of their organizations and the community. And one of the things I want to talk about here is the term GIS and its meaning. Uh, what's really interesting is I think that if we're going to deliver more value to our organization and the community, we got to get people to understand what we're here to do. And the term GIS is problematic, actually, because people that hear the term GIS think map. Oh, you're the map maker. Those are the map makers. Well, map making is a valuable skill, and it's very hard to do, and, and there's big value in maps. But if you have access to GIS, you should be doing a lot more than maps. So we've got to shed this map maker image. And part of that, um, the way you can do that is by rebranding and dropping the term GIS from your job title and from your department name because it actually doesn't make sense because GIS is the tool we use, it's not what we do. So you don't see a spreadsheet department in your organization, right? So why do we have a GIS department? So we should have terms that better describe what we do, such as location intelligence. But let me show you some examples of people that are doing this. So, you know, these are real job titles of your your peers across the country and uh, in Australia and Canada as well as other ways they're describing what they do. I really like that third one, data analytics and visualization services. Um, uh, that enterprise location intelligence from Walgreens, I love that one. Uh, business analytics intelligence and reporting or business and location intelligence and business and location innovative services. So People are realizing this, they're shedding the map maker image, they're doing that by rebranding their job titles and their departments. And I think it's an important thing for us to think about and, and to do to help us change our image. So the vision here, I wanna show you my vision for where I think we can go in an organization as an industry if people at the top realize the value, right? So every organization has a top executive, let's call it the CEO. And as soon as technology became important to organizations, you know, they designated somebody to direct that to, to be the chief technology officer. But as technology has gotten more diverse and complex and more important to the organization, you're seeing additional technology based executives offices being created. You're now seeing chief innovation officers, chief data officers, chief analytics officers. So if we can convince that CEO at the top of the importance of location intelligence, why shouldn't there be a chief geospatial officer? I think there's a possibility to do that. And let me show you some examples from around the globe of people that are in the process of making this happen. 
So these are all GIS, you know, they're, they're your peers. They're, they came out of the GIS industry and they're moving up. You can see CIOs, chief data officers, chief technology officers, We've got directors of IT and innovation. We've got IT directors, uh, innovation, business and location intelligence officers, directors of data analytics and visualization services, et cetera. Vice president of real estate market research, list goes on and on, deputy CIOs, et cetera. So these are people just like you who over the years have moved up in the organization into leadership roles to, and they're able to really uh, deliver even more value via GIS to the organization. So uh, I suggest you reach out to these people on LinkedIn, get to know them, uh, talk to them, find out from them how they did it and, um, and emulate them and use them as mentors. Now I'd like to call out a few of them. First, uh, Todd Shanley, he's right up the road for me in Charlotte here, up in Cabarrus County. Uh, really amazing stories. You know, 23 years ago, he started out as a part-time intern using GIS, and he's now the CIO uh, in charge of enterprise IT operations. And this year, he was listed by, um, by uh, the Digital County Survey from uh, the Digital Government's annual survey of one of the top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers of 2020. And they've scored in the top 10 um, of Digital County's survey uh, uh, for the past six years. And last year, they came in first place. So really an amazing person um, who started out, you know, just like all of us. Uh, this is Nick O'Day from uh, Johns Creek, Georgia. And he went from GIS manager to chief data officer. And then we've got Tracy McKee over in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she was the GIS manager and she's now the new chief innovation officer. So really great examples of people out there uh, making it happen. And then, you know, even if you can't uh, move up into some big executive position, you know, there's other ways to show your importance in an organization. And sometimes um, people, the way they do it is by, by a reorganization. And so these are, um, Four examples here of local government uh, GIS uh, managers who were doing such a good job. And it, instead of moving up into new positions, what they did was they reorgan reorganized where they were in the organization and they now report directly to an executive. So if a CEO or a city manager or a COO really thinks GIS is important, they're going to have them report directly to them. And that's what I'm seeing here. So. These folks, you know, did move up into some flashy new title, but they got reorged because their work matters and now they're getting direct um, direction from an executive. So um, there's lots of ways to um, to provide more effect um, and more change on an organization than just moving up into an executive position. Show your value to executives. And uh, if, it, if it makes a difference for them, then th they'll start working closely with you and you can really, really do a lot more um, out there. So I, I, wanna, I just wanna make sure that that was clear. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. You know, first of all, uh, I just wanna really put this right in the front of your brain. And that is that we've got to work on all five pillars of location intelligence. We can't just spend 100% of our time on technology and data. You've got to work on strategy. You've got to work on organization, culture, and literacy. Uh, and so please set time aside to do that. Get some skills in those areas, some leadership skills, some skills in each one of these areas. Um, talk to other people in our community that, that are doing this. Um, and you know, work with anybody you can to learn more about how to be effective in these five areas. And get help. You know, nobody on these that I've highlighted here has done this all by themselves. There's a great GIS community. Please reach out to that community and get help. And Esri has a lot to offer here to help you. I just wanna make sure of all the ways we're available for you to help you. And number one, your account team, you have an account manager and a solution engineer, they're there to help you out. Also to let you know, if you're not aware of it, Esri has a big, huge group of subject matter experts that are experts in every different industry um, from public works to, to law enforcement, to planning, to economic development, to engineering, to architecture, you name it. Uh, so if you need to, you need some assistance in talking to someone in, in a certain industry like public works or transportation, and you don't know how to talk to them because you don't know about their industry, reach out to your account team. We can tab one of our subject matter experts to help get involved and help bridge that communication gap. We've got a range of services available to you, whether it's consulting, 
I mentioned the training consultant who can help you with the workforce development plan. We've got world um, you know, leading technical support. We do have premium support available at an additional cost that'll give you support 24 seven, 365, which is critical if you're supporting um, parts of your business that do work around the clock. We have a wonderful advantage program that wraps you know, the consulting, the training, and the tech support all together. You get a designated technical advisor that helps you with an annual work plan. Um, most of our most successful customers have this Advantage program. So if you're interested in that, reach out to your account team. And then we've got a wonderful set of partners network across the globe. Be aware that they can earn specialties. And so if you need help in a certain area, look for a partner that has earned a specialty in that area because they'll be a step ahead of the other ones. And then check out the ArcGIS Marketplace where they uh, show off their, their products. Uh, and if you need help selecting a partner, reach again, reach out to your account team. So um, it's time to seize the opportunity that's in front of you. Um, with everything going on with the pandemic and the economy and all kinds of things, are your colleagues need your help and want your help. They just don't know that you can provide it. So reach out to them, step into that spotlight, uh, show them what you can do, you know, apply the technology to help the business be more performant and emerge on the other side of this pandemic even better than before and step up and lead and affect change in your organization to make it better. So lastly, I want to finish this up with a couple of thoughts. You know, number one, there's a difference between having a job and building a career. Think about which you want to do. Some people go in and they do their job and they go home and they get their paycheck and they're happy. But other people want to build a career. And I don't know about you, but that's what I'm trying to do. And if you want to step up and be a leader, you'll build a career and you'll be much better off and your organization, and your community will be much better off. And then think about that when you're gone from your job, how will you be remembered? How will people talk to you, talk about you after you're gone from your current job? Uh, again, I don't know about you, but I want people to talk about me in a positive light about how I was an agent of change and I helped the organization be better uh, and accomplish things and be focused on the business and provide a lot of value. So if so, you've got to do that every day and you've got to get up and go to work and um, you know, have purpose in your work and just be inspired to do that. You know, it, it's really possible. We've seen lots of great examples here. Okay, if you're interested in uh, a different version of this presentation, uh, I, I put this together as a series of three blog posts on LinkedIn. So you can go to LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn and um, on my profile, I'll there should be a link. Um, to the first part. Again, it's three parts. It's got all the hyperlinks in it that'll get you to more information as well. Um, so I, I definitely suggest you do that if you, if you want to see the version of that. Um, so that's all I've got. Here's my contact information. I have email. I'm uh, active on GeoNet, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I love to connect with the GIS community directly. I love to hear your stories. I love to help tell your stories to others and help you be successful any way I can. So with that, I will turn it back over to Rob and be happy to take any questions that are available. Awesome, thank you, Adam. That was fantastic. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question, you're free to unmute your microphone and ask verbally or, uh, or just type in the chat window. I see some thanks. Uh, also, you're welcome. Yeah, also just- Hey, saying, Adam. Michelle Field has uh, posted some of the links to the resources that Adam was talking about during his presentation. So um, we'll try to uh, get that in a format that we can uh, send out to you later um, with these with these links if you don't have a chance to get to them all right now. And I'll provide it. Like I said, I'll provide a version of the slides. It's all hyperlinked as well. Awesome. Anybody out there with any questions? No? Well, I was definitely- Hey, Adam. Oh, go hey. on. Hey, who's that? It's Laura Lee, how are you? Oh, hey, Laura Lee, I'm doing great, how about you? Doing good, doing good. I wanted to ask you, how much contact have you had in regards to managers using your COVID solutions? Um, I've had a little bit of interaction with that. Um, uh, if you want more information, I can connect you with actually our health team. 
who every day are working with people across the globe with those um, with those COVID uh, applications. But the few that I've had um, uh, communication with, direct communication with, is they're seeing big time success with them and they're seeing a new understanding from executives and the community on the value of GIS and they're really starting to understand it um, much more and it's really helped them. I mean, I don't wanna paint the pandemic as a good thing, but if I look at the GIS well, industry, it really is. It is, I think, helped move us years into the future where now more people know what we do and the value we can bring, so. Well, I'm looking at doing some office hotel work, hopefully, uh -huh. in the next coming week. So I yep. just kind of wondered that because it's so interesting what they're doing. It's, uh, it's almost scary, but it's incredibly interesting. Yeah, we have an, we have a social distancing indoor hoteling office hotel solution, actually. Um, so that one's already built. I would reach out to your Esri account team and they can connect you with that the group uh, in our indoors group. Um, and they can talk to you directly yeah. about that solution. Good deal. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice to hear from you, Laura Lee. Anybody else? All right. I see they're going to post a video for this. That's great. Yeah, I was going to see if, if uh, actually um, meant to ask you before if it's okay if we. No, we sure. We have a YouTube channel where we post our webinars. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, the more people that can see it, the better. So, yep. yeah, and, and um, I was also going to, well, I was going to mention that I think we have a, one of our colleagues on the call here is actually a big proponent of some of the things you've already, uh, or that you mentioned in your webinar. I know uh, Scott Trapolino, who I used to work with here at DeSoto County, has recently uh, started working with the City of Olive Branch, and I've heard him talk about some of the things he's doing there that sound a lot like what, you know, um, just getting more people using GIS, uh, talking, working directly with the mayor about the business proposition, um, and it, you know, y'all, Scott is a fantastic resource. He's right here in our community. Um, he could probably tell you some amazing stories about what he's been doing here. But um, just want to give him some props. He's, a, he's really kind of leading the way here in DeSoto County. Well, y'all, I mean, go I've got to give it back to Adam. You know, I've been listening. I think I have listened to Adam give presentations now for several years. And, uh, if y'all just read through the materials he's given you, I've read through almost everything that he, he put in that presentation. It's really, really easy to put it into practice. So if anybody needs any help locally, I'll be more than glad to sit down with you and just show you how to really, it's just taking the technology and putting the technology behind you. And it's getting people to be more efficient and save them time. And that essentially saves money you're not necessarily telling that person they're saving the city or the county or the business money. You're telling them they're making more efficient decisions and being more effective and they have more personal time at work if they use these GIS technologies. And then you spin it off to their manager. Well, hey, look, I just got this person that used to take them 27 hours to do this one process. Now they're doing it in 30 minutes, you know, or an hour. And so now we freed them up to let them work in other areas or avenues to grow their own professional, you know, whatever they're doing, whether it's a clerk or, you know, a business analyst, it's, it's, it's fun to watch the light bulb come on in people's heads. And I've seen Adam say that many times. It's fun. It's fun to watch somebody say, Oh my gosh, this is just, you know, I was so scared to touch this and now my life is so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Scott. You know, I, I've, I've been aware of you and your work for many years now as well. And, and I would really love to hear it from people like yourself that are actually, you know, applying it and making, making it happen right in your organization. You know, it's, it's real difficult for us because we all, we all, you know, most of us are the same. I have a degree in geography and urban and planning. I don't have any degree in IT or business or anything like that. Right. And so we're, we're not really prepared for what we should be doing in the organization. And if you think about it, I mean, the job description of a GIS manager, most job descriptions of GIS manager are wrong, right? They're like, they were written 20 years ago, right? When everybody had to come to the GIS department to get the GIS work done because we're the only people that knew how to do it, right? 
Well, that's right. not GIS anymore. Our job's now to help everybody use GIS. And that's a completely different job description. So job, you can look at a job board right now for an opening for a GIS manager and read that job description. It's wrong, right? You need to be able to know the business. You need to be able to know what it's like to run an enterprise IT system, to market it, to strategically design it, to affect the business of the organization. I mean, that's nothing we were prepared to do. So it's a really interesting situation, and I'm just here to help us get through that because there's so much opportunity for us to provide so much value to our organization and community that we're leaving out there. I mean, we could just do so much more, and it would just make us better, organization better, and the community better. So thanks, yeah. Scott. Yeah, and thank you, uh, both y'all. I know when I first started working for DeSoto County, Scott was my mentor, and he would tell me, well, what you need to do is go learn how – people in this department do their jobs and in this other department learn that, learn how they do their jobs and then show them how to do it better. Which yep. That's it. And I've seen him do it over and over again. And now that he's at Olive Branch, uh, he recently borrowed some of our laptops so that he could go train up some people over there. They had no GIS background, how to use a, uh, how to use art maps so they could make their own maps. I think, I guess that's what they're doing. But yeah. And then I know he's training people over there. <laughs> And I mean, another key point here, too, is that when you are successful with helping people do things faster or save money or whatever, document that and then publicize it. Because bringing value to the organization is one thing, but if nobody knows about it, then they're not aware that you're delivering that value. And when budgets get cut, which they're going to be, or when they're anytime it's budget time, they're looking at who is actually saving the organization money and making the organization better. So document the effects of your work and then publicize it internally and externally. Um, and, you know, I, I, I did a presentation at the user conference this year. So if you've got access to that, it's in there recorded. It's about communicating the value of GIS ROI. And I give about 10 different best practices on how to best do that. So let the folks know what you're doing. Um, toot your own horn because nobody else is going to do that. And if they don't know about the value, then, you know, you're not going to get the resources you need. Okay, guys, not to Roger, cut you off, but we have about five minutes left. So we're going to go ahead and do the license giveaway. So we have three licenses. Um, the first license goes to Chris Denley. Um, so if you guys will provide me your email address, you can uh, go to the chat box and click everyone and scroll down to either uh, magic or my name and type in your email address so that we can get you those licenses. Um, so Chris Denley, you are the first winner. So congratulations. Um, the second winner is Sunny Emmert. I apologize if I said that wrong. So Sunny E. So you are the second winner. Um, and if you guys could just type in the chat box that you're here so that I know that we're actually giving them to someone, that would be great. Um, and then the last person is Lee Owens. I haven't seen anything in the chat box yet, you guys. <laughs> Are you there? I see Chris just replied. Okay, yes, Sunny yeah. is here, Chris is here. I'll say, uh, maybe we're probably gonna start, uh, we're still figuring out Zoom to be honest with y'all, but we are going to start requiring probably a registration for future events so that we'll already have all your contact info. When you... Hey Scott, I think you're uh, picking up Rob. Sorry. <laughs> I'm done. It might have just been me. I'm not sure. But yeah, we got. Hey, are you there? Okay, Sunny, Lee, and Chris, will you please uh, type to me your email address that you would like your licenses? Um, and don't forget that our after hours, we are also giving away two other licenses. So if you join us there, you can have a chance to win. Um, so this is very exciting. Yeah, hey, Michelle, I, I, I've got Chris's email address. It seems like he chatted it privately to me, but um, I can actually just put it in the public chat. Uh, no, you can you can just send it to me, or you can. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm just going to send it to you through the private chat. Okay, 
Got it. So thank you so much, Adam, for joining us today and giving this great presentation. I've been looking forward to listening to you speak and I am very excited because I'm actually doing this in my organization now. So getting to hear you talk about it has been very helpful. Well, I'm glad and you know, thanks for finding me and um, getting me connected here with Magic. Um, happy to support you guys anytime. Uh, again, uh, I'd love to do it in person. Yep. We will love to have you back. Hopefully cool. uh, our conference will be in person next year right. or the Great. year after, hopefully. Great. Bring you back and take you for some good barbecue. There we go. That's what I need. Uh, we're just still in Zoom forever. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, everybody. Um, yeah, good to see you, Laura Lee. Um, everybody, please uh, remember, we'll uh, come back and visit us again in one hour for Magic After Hours. We'll, we'll kick back and... and um, Kick back with Scott. See y'all shortly. Bye everybody. Right. And I have saved the chat. So this will also go uh, with the YouTube video. So if you guys wanna look at the YouTube video for the information or just see the chat, you can. All right, everybody, back to work. Bye.